Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show. So in this video, I'm going to address the question, can we edit the epigenome? So since the discovery and development of CRISPR-Cas9, there has been much hope in editing the genome, not only by inducing double-stranded breaks and causing indels to disrupt gene expression, but by homology-dependent repair mechanisms for precise genome editing. It seems certain that genome editing will be a critical player in the treatment of genetic diseases and as a research tool. But what about using CRISPR-Cas technology for another purpose? Editing the epigenome. Well, we'll be taking a look at this in this video, but the first thing we need to know is, well, what is the epigenome? Now, I could give you a very fancy definition of what the epigenome is, but I think it's better to think about it this way. Each of your cells in your body has the same DNA, yet each of your cells are different. The reason that they're different is because they're expressing different genes. And one way that those different genes are regulated is through so-called epigenetic marks. And so these epigenetic marks govern what genes are expressed and this governs the cellular state. It tells the skin cell it's a skin cell or it tells your liver cell it's a liver cell. And so the key thing with epigenetics is that it appears to be heritable. So if that cell divides, it still knows that it's going to be a skin cell and doesn't suddenly change into something different. And so they're heritable, and they're not encoded in the DNA sequence, which is the same in all of your cells. And so what differs between different cell types is the way that that DNA is packaged within the nucleus, where the DNA is located within a cell. And so DNA is wrapped around proteins known as histone proteins, and together they're referred to as chromatin. And so depending on how tightly packaged regions of this chromatin is can depend on how accessible it is to different transcription factors and other proteins that can mediate and activate gene expression. And what governs the packaging of chromatin very much depends on the chemical modifications that can be found on these histone proteins. But it also seems that modifications on DNA itself, such as cytosine methylation, also have a role in influencing gene expression. And so it's, it is quite a complicated thing to try and define, and I hope I've done a relatively good job. But basically, epigenetics is important for influencing what genes are expressed within a cell. And these marks can be heritable, but they can also be reversible. And understanding epigenetic marks and their regulation better is of extreme value, given the fact that epigenetic abnormalities have been associated with various diseases, such as cancer, diabetes, asthma, and fibrosis, and also aging itself. And more on from that, it can help to understand other processes of great interest, such as cellular reprogramming, where you go from one cell type to another, which as given my definition of epigenetics, means that those epigenetic marks need to be reconfigured such that that cell that was thinking it was a neuron now needs to, you know, change those marks and think it's a different type of cell. In this case, a stem cell. And so at this point, we can come back to the question of what is epigenetic editing? And so simply put, epigenetic editing is a way of altering these epigenetic marks at a specific locus. And the latter part is of most interest for this video because we're going to talk about ways that you can achieve epigenetic editing by using CRISPR-Cas9 systems. And so what I mean by specific locus simply means a specific site of DNA. And so epigenetic editing would therefore be technologies that enable the precise modification of epigenetic marks at a specific site. And so CRISPR-Cas9 is a really useful system for that. Why? Because the CRISPR-Cas9 complex that consists of the protein Cas9 and the so-called guide RNA enable the complex to be recruited to specific sites on the DNA sequence, whereby there are Watson-Crick interactions between the RNA and the DNA. And so that provides your site-specific specificity. <laughs> Site-specific so specificity, love it. Anyway, whilst the CRISPR-Cas9 canonical system enables the ability of reprogramming the guide RNA sequence and therefore the sites in which the complex targets, in its canonical form, it will also end up inducing a double-stranded break, which isn't really what we want to do here. Instead, we don't want to change the DNA sequence, we want to change the epigenetic marks. So how can that be achieved? Well, there are very many many different ways in which this can be achieved. And it also very much depends on what it is you're trying to change, as there are many different types of epigenetic marks. 
talking about these different epigenetic marks would literally be a video on its own. Probably a very long video and an ever-changing video because it seems that every month, every week, there's different epigenetic modifications that seems to be uh, discovered, which is super exciting, but makes it very hard to then make a video about it. So instead, I'm going to give two examples, maybe focusing on histone acetylation and histone methylation. But before we take a look at the different ways in which these epigenetic modifiers act, it's important to know the similarities between these different mechanisms, and that's by using the so-called dead Cas9. So what a dead Cas9 refers to is a Cas9 protein that's been mutated such that it no longer cuts DNA. So you don't get any single-stranded or double-stranded breaks. And so that's good because we're no longer going to be manipulating the DNA sequence, but it retains that programmable DNA binding activity that enables the precision in epigenome editing. And so when it comes to being able to mediate epigenetic editing, all that effectively needs to be done is to fuse the Cas9 protein to different enzymatic domains that can either effectively write the epigenetic marks or erase the epigenetic marks. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of research being conducted into epigenetic editing and erasing and writing epigenetic marks is just one way in which the epigenetic landscape can be influenced through this approach. But I've decided just to focus on these two here for now, just to keep this video a bit more simplified. But if you are interested, I have linked a couple of really good reviews in the description. In particular, this is probably the most extensive review I could find, and it even has beautiful figures. Anyway, before we look at these examples, we need to understand, we need to discuss what the desired impact of this editing is. And generally, in, in the case of modifying these epigenetic marks so far, it's in terms of being able to activate a gene or to re repress a gene to stop it being activated. And so different epigenetic marks can either be seen as being pro-gene expression or anti-gene expression. So it's better for me to just explain this with some pictures. And there's actually a nice review article that has some very nice figures that demonstrates both epigenetic regulation in terms of repression and activation. And so you can see here that this is Cas9 and this is the guide RNA recruiting it to the, the targeted DNA locus. And in this case, this Cas9 protein is fused to an enzymatic domain called LSD1. And LSD1 here actually stands for lysine specific demethylase. And so what this enzyme does is it removes methylation marks, in particular at the histone lysine 4 residue site. And the change from uh, methylation at the site to demethylation of the site causes epigenetic repression. And so it's thought that this modification could, in theory, prevent a gene from being expressed. And that's because by changing these methylation marks, it changes the proteins that read these marks that come into the vicinity and interfering with protein recruitment can affect the level of gene expression. And so similarly, but differently, the example on the right is of epigenetic activation, and this time Cas9 is fused to P300, and this enzyme has the activity of adding acetyl groups to lysine residues, as you can see here. And the addition of this acetyl group can then bring in different transcriptional machinery that can actually activate gene expression. And so the two examples I've just shown you are in modulating the epigenetic marks on histone proteins, but you can also do similar things with affecting the methylation status of DNA, in particular the cytosine methylation marks that I mentioned earlier. For example, in this 2016 paper here, they fused the Cas9 protein to a DNA methyltransferase protein, DNMT3A, that added DNA methylation marks to cytosine residues in the proximity of the CRISPR-Cas9 complex. And so since I've gone down this rabbit hole, we might as well stay down the rabbit hole. And I think I'll probably talk about transcriptional repression and transcriptional activation using a method other than changing the epigenetic marks, but instead by directly having domains that can bring in transcriptional ma machinery using CRISPR-Cas9 in a different video, which I'll probably make sometime soon. But to continue down this rabbit hole, we might as well now talk about the challenges of precise epigenome editing. And so one of the problems, which possibly isn't a problem, is the fact that there are just so many different epigenetic marks and so many different proteins that have similar enzymatic activities that effectively do the same thing. A big challenge would be finding the right protein or the, the right enzymatic domain and the right CRISPR-Cas9 system for the, for the job. And it goes beyond just finding the right epigenetic modification changes to be made, but also whereabouts the specific site should be in regards to the gene of interest. And so what I haven't really mentioned is that if you want to activate a gene, 
you're not going to target the CRISPR-Cas9 complex to the gene sequence itself, but you'll actually target it probably upstream of the gene, which is where the transcriptional machinery first gets deposited on DNA before it then plows its way through the DNA sequence during transcription. And so there's just many different ways that you can manipulate the system, which could have different impacts on the strength of the gene activation. And then that's the second thing. It's like you can talk about gene expression in terms of switching a gene on or switching a gene off, but you might want to kind of dial up that expression as well. Maybe you don't want a twofold increase, you want a slight increase. or Maybe you do want a really big increase. And there probably is ways in which you can control the epigenetic marks to have that precise control. Like the dimmer switch, right? You want to be able to dial it up instead of just flicking the switch on and off. Maybe this is just a big sidetrack, but anyway, this just would very much depend on what it is you were trying to do. And then secondly, one of the beauties with these tools at the moment is that it just enables us to better understand these different epigenetic regulators. Because, you know, I've given some examples where we do know what these enzymatic domains do, but there's still a lot that we don't know. And there's still other enzymatic modifications that we don't fully understand. So yeah, one general problem is just developing the tool and getting it to the right place at the right time. And then if we want to think about long-term translating to the clinic, then we want to talk more about delivery approaches. And if you're going to fuse Cas9 to these different enzymatic domains, you've made that Cas9 protein bigger. And these adeno-associated viruses that can deliver CRISPR machinery can only contain so much DNA. And so if you increase it by having these fusion proteins, you might have some problems with delivery. And then the other thing I haven't really touched upon here is like, in this case, we're actually editing the epigenetic marks. And we go back to what I said at the beginning of the video, epigenetic marks, by definition, are heritable. And so what happens if this change was made in a cell that's going to divide? Would it be passed on? So what is the maintenance or longevity of these different modifications? So if you managed to make it through the end of that, then congrats. I don't know how much sense that even made. But I think, yeah, the conclusion from this is like, this work is pretty interesting. And it adds just an additional level of regulation for what we can really do with cells, not in terms of therapeutic application, but in terms of further understanding the components that are already within our cells. And I think it will be very exciting to see what advances are made using these techniques. And I probably will make another video at some point going into more detail about the alternative ways of influencing gene expression, for example, in the context of cellular reprogramming that I feel like I didn't really have time to talk about in this video. But anyway, I still hope you've learned something in this video. Um, thank you to my Patreon supporters. And as always, thanks for listening.